Amen. Good morning again. I trust everybody's doing okay. Is that true? Hello. Good morning again. So Chris kind of stole my thunder because when I was singing that song, I said, I'll go up there and tell everybody what Hosanna means. And then he did it. So good job. It means save, right? But that's what they were crying out to Jesus when he came into the city in his triumphal entry. They were screaming, Hosanna, Hosanna, which basically means we need, we need help save us. You know, you're our savior. And so that's the name that we meet in today, in the name of Jesus. What are you people doing? These are my troublemakers over here. Well, one of them for sure. So anyway, we've been working through this series, like I said, Passion and Purity. And we're just kind of doing one week at a time. So when people are on vacation like they are today, and there's not a lot of people around, you won't miss you know, part of a series. Although the whole series is online. I just watched one of them the other day and said, why do I do all those vocalized pauses and weird hand motions? I don't know. But they're all online, and you can see it for yourself. Anyway, Haggai, I kidded around the other day because... I was working on a couple other sermons, and then this, this name came to me, and I said to my wife, I was thinking about preaching about Haggai, and she's like, shouldn't you use something that's in the Bible? <laughs> yeah, well, Haggai is in the Bible, but most people would miss it because it is one of 66 books, and it's really only probably one page or maybe two in your Bible. It's only two chapters, and they're not even really very long. But he is kind of in line with the very end of the Old Testament with Malachi. You know, right at the very end, there's just a couple minor prophets that come and a couple major prophets too. But right in the last three books of the Old Testament. So if you want to turn to it today, you can. You'll get ready in advance. So just go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and go back a couple and you'll find it. I guarantee it. Here's a question for you. We're here meeting in the name of Jesus we're here meeting in God's house, if you will. A lot of us will believe, if we have the Holy Spirit in us, that we are the temple of the Lord, right? And so here's the question. What does God care about? I'm not even going rhetorical this time. What does God care about? Raise your hands. Tell me something he cares about. Yes, ma'am. He cares about us. And not to pick on you because you're my dear friend, but that's very American, isn't it? I mean, he does care about us in a, in a sense. He cares about all of us, but we often think he cares about me. And he does care about us, but sometimes we can get a little bit too me, 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 right? But you're right. He absolutely cares about us, and he would have died for every single one of us. He would. Let's break it down more. What does God care about? Yes. Justice. Justice. Absolutely. He is justice, right? Give me something else. What does he care about? Peace. He came to bring peace to us. Well, in a great sense, he also brought a sword, which is his word, you know, and some bad things are going to happen. But yes, absolutely. Jesus is the prince of peace. What does God care about? Holiness. Holiness, which is a big word we use, only four letters, but it means separate, separate, set apart. He does care about holiness. Yes. Salvation. Salvation. Hosanna, right? He comes to save us. John 3.17, I've not come to condemn them, but to save them. Absolutely. I, I love in James where God breaks it down and says, true religion, true religion, real religion that God our Father approves is looking after widows and orphans in their need and remaining unstained by the world. Widows, orphans in their need, and remaining unstained by the world. Isn't that what we're saying? Justice, right? Mercy. Being unstained by the world is holiness. All that stuff is what God cares about. What do we care about? What do we care about? Now, this is rhetorical. I don't want you to answer it because the truth is, you know, if we were to be honest, it would shock some people. I think sometimes if we're honest with ourselves, it would shock ourselves. Sometimes just for fun, I like to go through my checkbook. You know, most of it's online now, but you just do the categories and spit them out. I'm like, wow, is that what I really care about? In my family, the number one bill is the groceries. You know, and we all know I care about food, right? It's true. I'm not going to miss a meal. I guarantee you, I'll miss all kinds of other things, but I'm not going to miss a meal. And so the truth is, what do we care about? Usually, ourselves. 
I mean, we just are. We get up on the throne. We just do. It's part of our sin nature. We care about ourselves. So this summer, you know, we've all taken trips. I've taken a couple. What happens in your home, if it's anything like mine, we'll see if it's true. Uh, when you get home, the moment you get home, after a long trip, Kids have been watching DVDs or whatever it is they do. They've been fighting the whole time, whatever. You finally pull into the driveway or the carport or whatever you have, pop the doors. What happens? Do all the kids immediately start unpacking everything and saying, hey, mom, hey, dad, how can we serve you? Right? No, that's not what they do. In fact, what my kids do is they disappear immediately. Like, oh, I got the disappearing king of all the world right over there, Daniel. He's amazing. He's, he's like by far my funniest and smartest and most serving son in most ways. But when something starts to smell like work, boom, he's gone. And he's good at it. You know, he's good at it. I got another kid. After dinner, you know, we kind of sit. We have devotional. And, you know, everyone kind of joins in. And then I say, okay, tonight, you know, thanks for the time and the devotional. Tonight, here's what we're going to do. We're going to clean the dishes up as a family. And I got one kid who always raises their hand. Dad, yes, I got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> and, uh, and she cannot help herself. She just has to do it. If it's time to do the dishes, she's got to pee. That's it. Has anybody else got any problems like that? Yeah? It doesn't matter. It starts young, believe me. But it doesn't get any better even when they get older. So anyway, Judah, which is what we call the two tribes of Israel that were left after ten tribes got all messed up, and that's called Israel. So Judah has been in Babylonian exile. So that's the tribes of, does anybody know? Benjamin and Joseph. You can check me on that, but I'm almost certain of it. And all the other ten tribes are kind of got messed up, and they become Samaria. And so anyway, these tribes got drug off. Does anybody remember the name Nebuchadnezzar? Right, a horrible, it started out to be a really horrible king. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, Daniel, the whole thing. All this happens in Babylon. And so anyway, God goes and he gets his people back from Babylon. And what do you think happened when they all got back? After this long exile, under this horrible king and oppression and all the bad stuff that was happening, did they immediately come back and said, this is awesome, we can serve God. No, they're pretty much like our families, you know? They're pretty much like our families. Hey, here's what they said. They get back from, not all of them came back, by the way, but the ones that did came back, they did come back. They said, oh, listen, let me tell you what I need to do. My family is first. My family is first. So we're going to go home, and we're going to take care of our stuff. And once we're done taking care of our stuff, then we'll come back, and we'll be more better members of the congregation of God's people. That's what we'll do. And so that's what they did, right? No, that's not what they did. They didn't come back. They didn't come back. They all went to their own homes, and they started building their own kingdoms, and they were doing a really good job of it. In fact, they were prospering. At least they thought they were. And so 18 years later, 18 years later, God says, hey, remember me? I'm the one who brought you once again out of all this slavery and all this depression, and you come back and you say, hey, we're just going to run home real quick, and we're going to take care of our stuff, and then we're going to come take care of God's stuff, but you haven't come back. You haven't come back. You don't care about me at all. And the excuses were everywhere. Well, yeah, but this. Well, yeah, but that. Well, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. Right? This is like my kids would do. But yeah, you don't understand, Dad. You know, you don't understand. This is what I got to do. This is more important. God doesn't care about excuses. God looks at our hearts, and he already knows the truth. You can throw out any reason you want, and that's what they were doing. You were throwing out all the reasons. God doesn't take any pride in that. Excuses just annoy him. And so what does he do? Well, he sends this guy, Haggai, (laughs) to talk to his people. Just out of nowhere. He sends this guy Haggai. And so we, just like them, have very short memories. I've been a Christian for, you know, quarter of a century. And sometimes yet I forget what God has done. What has he done? I forget who I was. You know, I'm not who I hopefully one day will be. But thank God I'm not who I used to be. And we forget what he's done. And then we start to wander off and serve ourselves. And so God sends prophets in to tell us, remind us. Hopefully today his word will speak to us. 
Um, just as a starter before I get into Haggai, uh, I said the thing about Daniel. Do you remember anything about Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel other than throwing him in the lion's den and all that stuff? Extreme. Extreme? His dream. His dream. Yeah, all kinds of interesting things happens. But here's what he did. He got to be very wealthy and nobody was more powerful than Babylon. The Babylonian Empire. Right? Empire. They were like Rome at one point, or, or United States of America, you know, at our high point, if you would. They were in charge. No one did anything without going to see Nebuchadnezzar. Well, Nebuchadnezzar got powerful. And one day, this happened in Daniel 4.30. As he looked out across the city, he said, Look at this great city of Babylon. By my own mighty power, I have built this beautiful city as my royal residence to display my majestic splendor. And what do you think God said? Good job, Nebuchadnezzar. Good job. Get yourself up on the throne. Look at it all you've done. Look at your yard. Look at your beautiful garden. Look at your wonderful harem of people and all these Jews you got in exile. Good job. No, God says, really? Really? You're going to do that? And he struck him right there on the spot. And for seven years, Nebuchadnezzar was out in the field eating grass like a, like a cow. God struck him down and said, really? In the end, believe it or not, even Nebuchadnezzar honors God. He honors God. Let me move on with my story. So the prophet gets sent to Israel. He comes out of nowhere. He has no heritage. He's, he's, like a, he's like a Melchizedek, if you read in the Old Testament, this priest that just comes out of nowhere. Some people believe he was a pre-incarnate Christ. I don't know if I can go there, but some people believe that of Melchizedek as well. Like it's a, a showing up of Jesus out of nowhere. But that's probably not true. But we do know that this guy has no reason to just show up and start preaching. It's just that God reaches out and says, here's my word, go tell my people. Um, pop your bulletins open today, and if you've already turned them in the Bible, that's even better. But it will also come up on the screen. Read with me Haggai 1, and I'm just going to go 3 through 6. Haggai 1, 3 through 6. Then the Lord sent his, this message to the prophet Haggai. Why are you living in luxurious houses while my house lies in ruins? This is what the Lord of Heaven's armies says. Look at what is happening to you. You have planted much, but harvest little. You eat, but are not satisfied. You drink, but are still thirsty. You put on clothes, but cannot keep warm. Your wages disappear as though you were putting them in pockets filled with holes. And I'm looking at this and I'm like, how does he know so much about me? You know, I eat, I eat, I eat, but I don't feel more healthy. I just get fat, right? You know, I work, work, work. My wife works, work, work. And we put it all in. At the end of the month, we're like, oh, what happened? You know, well, this happened, that happened. Wash machine broke. Something else happened. It's always like something is happening. It just, we just can't get ahead. And so I don't know if I'm like you, but that's what I kind of get. I'm like, is God, you know, is God trying to say something to me? Sometimes I think that he is. And then I wonder about our country. You know, I look out and I see vast wealth. You know, there's a lot of people who are poor, but let's just be honest. I mean, even the poorest of the poor and the poorest in our country have much more than probably people in India, you know, or people in sub-Saharan Africa and places around the world where they live on a couple bucks a year. I mean, we, even, our, even our poorest people have a lot, and yet we're more depressed than any other people. We're more, we're more dependent on all kinds of things, drugs and whatever else. And, I, and I'm not even talking about, you know, maybe the hard ones. I'm talking about sugar, you know, all the stuff we're addicted to that we can't get away from. Are we really, are we really so much different than they were? So, so here's the first fact I have for you today. It's not in the notes, but you can write it down. Undisciplined desire for more brings dissatisfaction to God, and punishment from God. That's what the scripture is saying. Undisciplined desire to serve yourself, to have more, to serve mamma, if you will. No one can serve two gods. You can either serve God or you can serve mamma, and mamma roughly translated as gain. Gain. Can you serve 
getting more answer of God. Undisciplined desire for more does not please God because it's all about putting ourselves up on a throne. Now listen, God is not opposed to our comfort. I'm not saying that. He's not opposed to our comfort. Our God loves us. He does. As long as it's not all about me, 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 and my comfort, my comfort, my comfort, because that's not good. But it's okay to be comfortable. It's okay to have a vacation. It's okay to have a nest egg. I'm not saying any of that. It's not, it's not bad to have a home where you're comfortable with air conditioning and things like that. But once it becomes your God, and you stand back and say, I have worked really hard. Look at this kingdom. Get ready to eat grass. Because God will make a hole in your pockets. You know, it just starts falling out. Because what's happening is this. A lot of it is being stolen from him. And he knows it. It's being stolen from him. And we're not talking about the tithes and the offerings, although we kind of are. Really what I'm saying is when you are so focused on you, you're kind of stealing yourself from God. You're kind of taking your gifts and your talents and your abilities and you're using them to serve yourself instead of God. And so he's being robbed in all kinds of ways. Not just money, you know, that come and go. But much more importantly than that. Now, let me ask you this. How's our economy? My broker called me the other day, and I don't have millions or anything. I don't even have close to millions. But he's like, you're doing good. I'm like, thank you. And then he says, you know, the economy's been so good lately, your stocks have doubled. I'm like, wow, I got 40 bucks. That's awesome, right? No, he's telling me this. He's like, your stocks have doubled. And I'm like, yeah, but what's going to happen to them tomorrow? Is our economy okay? Is it? Can you sustain 18, 19 trillion dollars? Most people have no idea what that number even means. We throw it around like my kids throw around gazillion. But it doesn't mean it's an actual number. And it's huge and it's a problem. Is our economy okay? Let me ask you this. Is our nation being denied, if you will, or resisted by God in some ways? Is our God denying us certain blessings because of where our hearts really are? I believe he is. I mean, I really believe he is. And I'm not saying God anymore blesses nations. He really blesses people. And as the people turn toward God, then the nation becomes blessed. They're cursed. Uh, But I do believe as a nation, you know, we're kind of struggling. We got holes in our pockets. We're spending more and more and more. But are we getting better, better, better? Just think for a second. Uh, it, ten years ago would have been 2005. 2005. Were we better off in 2005 than we are in 2015? What about 2000? Remember Y2K? I was retiring from the Air Force. I was super excited, you know. And I look back, I'm wondering, you know, I don't think our country's actually gone better in that 15 years in lots of ways worse. And then I start thinking a little bit further back. I'm like, what about 25 years ago when when I met and married my wife? You know, was it better then? And I don't want to say the good old days were better, but the truth is our country was stronger. And I'm not talking about specific presidents or specific people in charge. I'm just saying as a country. But let's go back just a little bit further, maybe 40 years or 50 years when some of the things that we take is just like not a big deal, some of the stuff we see on television, some of the things we do with our bodies or with our money, would never be heard of. They wouldn't be heard of. No one could even conceive it. And now unbelievable sins, specific sins called out by God, things that we do with our hearts or with our body, things that are called progressive and loving, would never have been conceived of just 50 years ago when I was four. Are we better off? Are we better off now that we abort our children at the rate we abort them? Is God happy? What about the way we spend? You know, the houses have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, and I got one of them. You ever heard of the tiny house movement? I kind of dig that a little bit, but then I got 10 kids. I'm like, I don't know if we can go that small. <laughs> you know? They're going to be all up in my business. But there's a little bit of attraction to it as well, isn't there? You know what? Everything you have, you will serve. Everything that you own, owns you. 
Everything must be polished. Everything must be dusted. Everything must be waxed, insured, gassed up, mowed, painted. And that's where we are. So I know we have amazing technology. Listen, I have an iPhone 6 Plus right over there. I'm not saying we haven't gone in a good way in some ways. We have. But at the same time, I can get on that phone, and in one minute, I can have the most unbelievably depraved insanity right there in video at any moment in time. Great country. I looked last week. The number one most searched thing on that phone or your phone or your internet at home is teenage pornography, number one. Number one. If you go to the number one porn site in the world, the number one thing searched, teen. They want to see teenagers doing this and doing that. Are we better? Are we? That a child can now go and get an abortion without her parents' knowledge. You can receive an IUD or any other kind of birth control to do whatever you want at 11 years old and in California at nine years old without your parents knowing about it. Is this better? I can't give my child an aspirin at Ankeny Middle School without a note from a doctor. And yet the parent cannot even know when the child is taken to see you know, uh, an OBGYN and receive something in their bodies. Friends, are we okay? Are we walking around a country with a bucket that has a hole in it? It fills up with depravity and everything good runs out the bottom. And then I can't just stop there because then I have to look at our personal finances. Are my personal finances better than they were 25 years ago? In some ways I have more ability, but in other ways I have more idols and more problems, more drama. Right? Do you have more month than you have money? Do you? Because most of us do. What about your struggle against sin? Winning or losing? It's rhetorical. <laughs> you are correct. Are you doing better this month than you were last month? Or is it the same old thing over and over and over? Because the greatest indicator of what you will do tomorrow is what you did Today, and without a significant emotional event, nothing ever changes except it kind of gets worse. Chaos theory, right? It doesn't get better, it gets worse. I wonder if this could be our problem. I wonder if Israel's problem could be our problem. Because you can go back 2,000 years, you can go back even further. You can go to the back part of Babylonian exile, and you can look at the people, and they're identical to us. We haven't changed a bit. We have the same sin natures. We have the same me, me, me kind of an attitude. So God just stops. He says, no, I am not going to let you do this. You're my people. I love you. You think you're benefiting, but you're not benefiting. It doesn't work just like the kid at home. It doesn't do what they're supposed to do. I'm going to start doing the punishment and the discipline and taking back some things and making their life a little more difficult. Create a significant emotional event. And maybe at some point they'll say, oh, you know what, maybe, maybe, maybe I will listen to my dad. And it's out of love. And so God sends Haggai out of love. And he says this, Haggai 1, 7 through 11. This is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. Look at what's happening to you. Now, go up into the hills. Bring down timber and rebuild my house. Then I will take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You hoped for rich harvests, but they were poor. And when you brought your harvest home, I blew it away. Why? Because my house lies in ruins, says the Lord of the heaven's armies while all of you are busy building your own fine houses. It is because of you that the heavens withhold the dew and the earth produces no crops. I have called for a drought on your fields and hills, 
a drought to wither the grain and the grapes and the olive trees and all your other crops, a drought to starve you and your livestock and to ruin everything you have worked so hard to get. Wow. That's a lot. God standing opposed to his own people. You know, it reminds me of another minor prophet. If you go from Haggai and you skip one book, then you go to Malachi. Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament, and a lot of people really want to avoid it because God was really sick of his people at that point. And not just his people, but specifically his priests. Because the priests do it, and then all the people do it. And I believe we live in a nation now. I read lots of books about this. Lots of them. Here's what happens. Well, we got to grow our church. Well, preacher, if you keep talking about this and this and this and this, you're never going to grow the church. you got to stop talking about that one, and you got to soften this one up a little bit, and then that one maybe you wouldn't talk about at all, and, and you soften the message. In some ways, they distort the gospel and make it something else. Some people say, God wants you to be rich and have your best life now. Does he? Does he? Is that what he really says? No, look at, look at this Malachi. This is powerful stuff. Malachi, I believe it's, I have to turn my page back, but I believe it's Malachi 3, yeah. Ever since, 3, 7, ever since the days of your ancestors, you have scorned my decrees and failed to obey them. That's like having a Bible and not reading it or reading it and not doing it or looking at the scriptures and then forgetting what they said because you don't want to hear it. And he says this, now return to me. And I will return to you, says the Lord of heaven's armies. But you ask, how can we return to you? We've never gone anywhere, man. We're right here. Should people cheat God? Should people rob God? One translation says, yet you have robbed me. You have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? What do we ever do to you? You've cheated me in tithes and offerings do me. And we're not just talking about money. It's about all the tenths that we're supposed to give, all the first fruits that we're supposed to give from our heart, from our effort, and from our pockets, yes. And so he says, you are under a curse. The whole nation has been cheating me. Are we a godless nation? I'm probably going to be fired for this or thrown out of the church, but I don't care. You know, I was reading about ISIS the other day, ISIS, 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 and I posted a bunch of stuff. Can you really set someone on fire and call yourself serving God? I probably said it from this pulpit. There's all kinds of stuff just going on, unbelievable stuff in the name of God. And yet this week I see Planned Parenthood. Our own government funds them with millions and millions of dollars, and they're selling the babies. They're selling the parts of the babies. They're crushing them in certain ways to save their hearts and their livers and all the little pieces of them so that they can sell them. And I think about ISIS, and then I think about that, I'm like, really? Who are we? Who are we? I was reading about Eisenhower. I didn't know this. I was reading a book this week about Eisenhower. Who reads about him? I don't know. I guess me. I'm reading about Eisenhower at the end of World War II, and what he did was he made the people in Germany march through the camps. Now, not all of them, just the ones that were in the neighborhoods around the camps. He made them march through and said, look what you did. And they said, we didn't do nothing. What did we ever do? We were just over there drinking beer, eating schnitzel. And he said, no, you were right there when it was happening right there, and you did nothing. Your mouths were shut, and you are as guilty as anyone. But I say to myself, how can I stop a government that doesn't care? What can I do? How can I stop Planned Parenthood or this or that or anything else? I can't do that. How can I fight the whole world? No, I can't do that, and neither can you, but we can turn our own hearts toward God. We can turn our own hearts toward God, and somebody else might see it, and they might turn their heart toward God, right? That's what happens. That's what's supposed to happen. And then God says this, I promise you, Malachi, if you do this thing, this thing you're supposed to do, which is keep me first, I will throw open the storehouses of heaven, and you have so much, you won't even know what to do with it. 
Your cup will run over to the point where you're like, wow, I don't know what to do. I'll give it away. I'll give it away. I'll give it away. You can't give it all away. He's just pouring it on you. That's what he says is going to happen. But very, very few Christians ever get amazing wealth. Very few. Because we can't handle it. What would happen if you had a lot of money? What would happen? As Tiger Woods, get a billion dollars and see what happens to you. You get known from being the greatest golfer in the world to being a psychopath, right? The only difference was a whole lot of money. You know how much trouble you can get in with a billion dollars? I know right up I'd have a nice airplane. No doubt about it. Nice airplanes take you to nice places, right? Right. Could we be trusted? Because the first thing I would think is, wow, what can I do with this money? Instead of how can I honor God? How can I turn my life into a thing that God says, I really appreciate you in the way you're doing this. Let me give you some more. You can do some more stuff with it. That's what's supposed to happen. Haggai says the same thing. He says that Judah's prosperity would return when their priorities were correct. When God's desires and God's heart was their desires and their heart, he would just blow their minds. And God is unchanging. There's nothing new about God. The same way he dealt with them is the same way he will deal with us. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Nothing about him changes. The same love, the same mercy. Second Chronicles uh, 714. I was reminded of it this week because everyone probably knows that verse. If you don't, as soon as I start reading, you'll be like, oh, okay, I know it. God is the same to Chronicles, through Haggai, through the New Testament, and the Old Testament. And he says things like this. If my people who are by my name, that's us Christians, humble themselves, pray, Seek my face. Turn from their wicked ways. He didn't say tell everyone to do it. He said you do it. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will restore their land. The answer is not the government. The answer is our hearts. And when our hearts are humbled, and they pray. They believe God is there and He cares about us and He wants us to talk to Him and He wants to bless us and have us serve Him. And we seek His face. And then we turn from our wicked ways. Then He hears it. And then He restores it. So step one, for your notes, you can take it home. Humility. How about instead of me, 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 me? How about... God, what do you want from this life? You know, I got breath in my lungs. I got blood in my veins. I don't know if it'll be there tomorrow, but I know it's here today. Humble me, God. Break me. Teach me your way. Pray. You know, part of humility is getting on your knees and saying, God, I can't do this anymore. I'm on the road to nowhere. Everything, 10 years, 5 years, however many it is, look back, it's not better. You've changed me, yeah, but I'm, I'm repetitively getting on the wrong path. I know that's not the right word, but you got me. And then seek his face. A few weeks ago, I, I just felt to, the need, no one knew this, no one knew. I just felt the need to, to fast and to pray and to get on my knees and pray. And, and you know, tears started to come. You know, it's, we start to realize when, when you seek his face and you see his glory and you, and you start to realize who you are, you know, what, you, what you're about, it, it starts to break you. And so you start saying, God, your way is better than my way. Let me help you uh, in some way with my gifts, my talents. Show me. And he does. He does. It's just like bam, 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 bam. It's the same thing he's been saying all, all along. It's not listening. And then, of course, repent means agree. That's what Chronicles is saying. It means agree with God, stop, and turn. That's what it means. So God's going this way, and I'm going this way, and he's calling, and then I seek his face, and then I hear him, and he says, stop, turn, 
walk with me. My ways are greater than your ways. And he says, I will hear you, I will forgive you, and I will restore you. Just like Jesus, right? I will hear you when you call my name. I will forgive you of your sins, and I will give you abundant life. Life you don't imagine. We think that means more stuff. No, it doesn't. It means abundant. It means when you look at it, I don't care if you got two beans and a tomato. You're like, I feel this is awesome. <laughs> you know, God has given me enough for today. I know I'm making fun, but seriously, I have a friend in another country, and it's a long story. I don't have time for it today, but she had two dresses and three green tomatoes, and she was in charge of the whole village. You're richer than anybody. She had two dresses. That means she didn't have to be naked when she washed dress. She had one to wear. And they look out and they say, we got Jesus, we got all we need. You got a tin roof, honey. Don't matter. It doesn't matter. I get the love of Christ in me. So, priority one is worship. Chris told me a few weeks ago, he probably don't want me to say this, but he said, sometimes when I'm leading worship, I feel like it's just dead. I don't feel like anyone's worshiping. I'm like, well, you can't really rest on your feelings, you know. It may or may not be true. You know, you don't really know what's going on in someone's heart. Just because they won't clap doesn't mean their heart isn't turned toward God. So let's just, you know, let's just worship, and hopefully people will see it. Number one priority for God's people is worship. And you cannot worship God without acknowledging his value, his worth, right? You can't worship without acknowledging his value. Well, if you could acknowledge his value, what would happen to your value? Would it go up or down? It goes up. <laughs> it goes up. Maybe what you want goes down. Maybe what you think is right goes down. But your value goes up because the God of the universe loves you and made you and cares about you and sent his son to die for you. How does your value go down? The value of, of orphans goes up. The value of widows goes up. Now, Paul said you don't have to feed the ones that are gossips. You can let them starve. It's actually in there. I'm not making a joke. It's true. He said, you don't have to feed them all. <laughs> Just feed the ones that are doing the right thing. Let the other ones go hungry. They'll get the attitude. Isn't that what God did to Haggai? He said to Haggai, let them starve. The ones who seek God, their value goes up. And so, obedience, obedience, and healthy fear of God that result in sacrifice, that, that is what salvation is. That's what brings salvation. You can't, you can't say, I'm a Christian and not obey God. It's impossible. God doesn't hear your yapping or my yapping. What he sees is the sacrifice that we put out. That's what he sees. And that's when he turns. Um, God promises something else. He promises that his people will have his presence when they honor him, when they obey him, when they revere him. Where two or more are gathered in my name, he says, I am. How do you gather in his name? Can I just say, hey, you and me, we're gathering in Jesus' name. Can I? Okay. So we believe that he honors that. That is a congregation, a church. But does he honor it if we don't honor him? Does he listen if we don't believe he answers? Does he serve us if we don't obey even the simplest commands? If we don't revere him, is he actually at our beck and call? You see, I think we're really confused sometimes about what God thinks and who God is. But God told Haggai when they did those things that his presence would be there among him. Haggai 1.13 then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave the people this message from the Lord. I am with you, says the Lord. And so God made their unsatisfying lie. He basically took their lives and he made them unsatisfying. And he worked against them until they listened. And they began to revere him and they began to obey. Which reminds me of Jesus, of course, who is God Almighty in the flesh. And he said, if you are not with me, you are against me. If you do not sow with me, you scatter. That, that's what we do. We don't realize that when we go our own way, we're fighting God. 
We think, oh, well, I'm ahead. I'm ahead. I got it all for myself. I kept it all for myself. No, you are not ahead because God is not with you. He's fighting you. He's against you. Imagine you have an honored guest at your house. Just imagine for a minute. Jesus shows up. Two people are there meeting in Jesus' name. And what you do is your honored guest comes in, and then when they sit down at the table, you take the best piece of chicken, right? Even though you know they like the thigh, you eat that one anyway, right? You sit them over on the side somewhere. You give them a couple scraps, or actually you just throw the bone to them. Have you honored them? And <laughs> Susan's laughing at me. But that's what we do. We invite them over after we already ate it. <laughs> I just wanted to have some turkey. Well, we already ate that. Now we're watching football. See if you can find anything on those bones. Making God wait while you serve yourself is sin. Making God wait while we do what we think, or what we want is sin. It's sin. It's separate from God. It is denying God. I was fearless. I know God put his spirit in me. He was fearless. He has, like I said, no royalty. He has no position. His name doesn't mean anything to anyone. But he has God's message and God's spirit, and so it makes him fearless. And I thought to myself, what could Haggai do alone? Could he just go up and say, hey, everybody, you're making a mistake? No. Without God, you know, they would be just like, go away, little annoying person. That's kind of what we do, right? <laughs> go away. But when you know it's from God, you got his message, who, who, could Haggai not win if God was on his side? And so God is with Haggai. But what, what the people really need is that to happen to them. And that's what we need to happen to us. We need to acknowledge God's truth, and then we need to get busy. Acknowledge God's truth, turn, right, and get busy. And so that's what they did. They said, you're right. You're right. You got us. We're going to take what we got, we're going to give it to God, and we're going to go build this temple. We're going to do it right now. And so they quickly got after it. And then after a few months, they become discouraged. And then half of them quit, and then maybe some more of them quit, and they all started griping and complaining. Wow, that sounds like a church start. Doesn't it? Doesn't it? So they realized real soon that they didn't have the resources. We can't even compete with Solomon's temple. How can we compete with Solomon's temple? It was awesome. Right? And so they were doing it, but they got discouraged. And I thought to myself, maybe some of them started with the wrong motives. Maybe they heard God, you know, saying, oh, I'm, take, I'm taking your stuff and I'm, I'm messing with your money. And so they went and they started building the thing because they thought maybe that God would stop doing that. Um, they wore out very quickly. So I think if they had the wrong motives, maybe that's why. They become discouraged. They become discouraged because it was more about them building the temple than it was about building God, right? About honoring God. And that's what happens. We get discouraged when it becomes about us. Then we look at our neighbor's church. Wow, that church is awesome. Then we look at our temple. Our temple is old. And we start judging that. Does it matter if God is with us? No, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what everyone else does or what everyone else's church is. What, what we got to do is we got to do our best. And God gives us that. When we make him number one, then he blesses us and he promises us all kind of stuff. So we don't need to look at our neighbor's house or our neighbor's church. What we need to do is stop keeping up with the Joneses and we need to actually do what God has as a priority. What does God love? I already asked you. What does he care about? So we know what that is, and that's what we have to do. And whatever he is, it's good enough. It's good enough. It doesn't matter if you're an old building and somebody else has a big one. It doesn't matter about all that stuff. Where God is, and when our hearts beat with what he wants, it's good enough. Because he is responsible for the end results, not us. We turn toward him. We do what he says, and he is responsible. Haggai 2.9, the future glory of this temple will be greater than its past glory, says the Lord of heaven's armies, and in this place I will bring peace. I, the Lord of heaven's armies, have spoken. And so, like I said, God does not change. He never called anyone to amazing success. Never. He calls us simply to uncommon faithfulness. That's it. Faithfulness. Ezra 6.14, the first part of the verse is this, so the Jewish elders continued their work and they were greatly encouraged 
by the preaching of the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, son of Edo. The temple was finally finished as had been commanded by the God of Israel. But before Haggai leaves the stage, God calls him to do one more thing. And he speaks to the people again, especially the priests. Haggai 2, 13 and 19. Then Haggai asks, If someone becomes ceremonially unclean by touching a dead person and then touches any of these foods, will the food be defiled? And the priest answered, Yes. Then Haggai responded, That is how it is with this people and this nation, says the Lord. Everything they do and everything they offer is defiled by their sin. Look at what is happening to you before you began to lay the foundation of the Lord's temple. When you hoped for a 20 bushel crop, you harvested only 10. When you expected to draw 50 gallons from the wine press, you found only 20. I sent blight and mildew and hail to destroy everything you worked so hard to produce. Even so, you refused to return to me, says the Lord. Then he, re- he re- told them to remember this day, the 18th day of December, the day when the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. They repented. He said, think carefully. I am giving you a promise now while the seed is still in the barn. You have not yet harvested your grain and your grapevines, your fig trees, your pomegranates, and the olive trees have not yet produced their crops. But from this day onward, I will bless you. What did they do different? They just turned their hearts toward God. They just turned their hearts toward God and give him what is due him. That's it. And then he is responsible for everything else. And so I know we're talking about Judah, but you can take that and you can directly say that we now in Christ are God's people. We are God's people. Whether we're a wild root that's grafted in or whatever else, we are connected to God and we are his people. We have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We've been forgiven of our sins. Um, And then I ask you this, how much more would be required of the bride of Christ than those people who never even heard the name Jesus were only dreaming of hearing it? How much more would be required of the people who actually have been forgiven of their sins and had the Son of God on a cross crying out their name? Well, the Scripture says, when someone has been given much, much will be required in return. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. Um, I was reading a book this week, another one. It's called The Autopsy of a Deceased Church. And I shared this with the elders because it really moved me. It's a small book. I know Tom Rainer personally. Um, He is the CEO of Lifeway Christian Books, but I knew him when he was an interim pastor here in Dayton, Ohio. Um, And he wrote a book based on 14 churches that died. And I picked it up because not only because I know Tom, but because we took over a church that died. They were here for 50 years, and they had great dreams. And they, they just were going to slay this neighborhood and lead, lead everyone to Christ, but they got stuck in their ways, and, and things started going wrong, and then things started going downhill. And before long, you know, 50 years isn't that long, they wound up giving the church, in their own words, to some crazy conservative, psychopath, non-denominational church. I mean, that's what they basically said. They are sad about it because they are more progressive and all about stuff that we weren't about. But here we are. Too much has been given. Much is dead churches. All these churches that they looked at, this is probably the most powerful thing I read in here. Members of the dying church weren't willing to go into the community to reach and minister to the people. They weren't willing to invite their unchurched friends or relatives They were not willing to expend the funds necessary for any vibrant outreach. They just wanted it to happen. They just wanted it to happen without prayer, without sacrifice, and without hard work. I can't stop thinking about that. Without what? Prayer, which is a humbling, right? Which requires people to get on their knees and say, God, what do you want? Without prayer, without sacrifice, do we really honest to goodness think that we can call ourselves God's people if we don't sacrifice? He cares about sacrifice more than obedience. Or is it the opposite way? Yeah, it's the opposite way. You got the point. 
and without hard work. And so I close today. I'm, I'm moved about how God takes people that are running away and he does what he does to bring them back. And he does it to like a nation like, like Judah, but he did it to me. He did it to me. And pretty much everything I used to think was awesome, I now lament and, and, and I'm sad about. I'm not, I'm not perfect, believe me, I'm far from it, but that's, that's the truth. And I think probably he might be doing that to this church. I'm a little, I'm a little concerned. I'm, I'm your pastor, and I'm telling you I'm a little concerned. I've read books that say everyone who helps you start the church, 90% of them will be gone after one year. Guess how many years we've been here? One year. Guess how many people are gone? Right, and it says this because a lot of people who help start churches are kind of mavericks, and they get tired of churches, and they move along. They move along a lot. In the last week, I've had a dear old gentleman who sits back here, and I am in no way, shape, or form uh, giving any discouragement about this. But he met, he met a young woman. Who's, he's 77, so she's 60-something. And, and he wanted to go to her church. And I blessed him and said, I know you're lonely. Your wife died. I got the whole thing. God bless you. God bless you. But he's gone. And I had somebody call me this week and say, hey, we're not going to be able to come to your church anymore. And I said, why not? And they said, well, because some people started rumors about us. And so we don't go there anymore. We don't see them. And I said, but that's not what God says. God says this. And they said, listen, it's our decision. And then I had somebody else with another thing. And then somebody else with another thing. And somebody who said, hey, listen, we've been giving, but we can't give anymore. And we've had a bad time. So I hope you can understand. And at the end, I just look at the whole picture. And I say, God, I think we actually think that we can start a church without prayer without sacrifice, without serving, and we can't. That's the truth. So I know there's just a few of you here, but that's my challenge today. If this church does not make it one more year, I'm not Pontius Pilate, but I'm saying I'm washing my hands of it. I, it's not my fault. I am serving, and I'm doing my best. But in the last two weeks, I personally have taken finances out of my personal account, which I did not have, to meet payroll, to meet bills. And at this very moment in time, we're one mortgage payment behind, and we're, we're in, in arrears with our DP&L, and we're in arrears with the water. It's not my fault. I've done all I can. Today, if you're here and, and you're a visitor, this is not about you. This is about us. Uh, what we have is a message for you that God loves you so much that he sent his only begotten son. And if you believe in him and put your trust in him and believe God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And he will put a new heart in you and he'll give you a new mouth. He'll give you a new song to sing and he will give you abundant life. That's God's honest truth. For the people who are members and regular attenders, what I'm saying to you is we have got to do this thing well. We've been given much. Look around. Much is required. Father in heaven, you are awesome. And we should revere you. We should humbly shake at the thought of you. God, I pray that you would move our hearts to me, God, it does not matter if this church is here tomorrow. What I want, Lord, is for you to be glorified any way you want it. And I pray, God, if there are people here who are like-minded, and, and if this is a place where you want to be glorified, and you want this place to be sanctified, and you want us to reach this community, that you would break our hearts, Father, with the things that break your heart that you would show us the neighbors or the relatives or the friends that you would just start to impress them upon us in a way we cannot get away from. And we would embrace inviting them or sharing with them or whatever it takes, God. And Father, I pray that you would turn our hearts toward you with our gifts and our talents and with our treasure. May you get all the glory, Father. And I pray it in Jesus' name.